Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials video number eight. This is on reproductive isolation and speciation. In other words, how we go from one species to two. Uh, and we do that through reproductive isolation, or isolating them reproductively. Um, an example of this, uh, a really good example of this, this is Diane Dodd in the 1980s. She took a group of fruit flies and she just fed them different things. So this group had, ate just starch and these ones ate just maltose. And after eight generations, when they were done, a group of individuals that originally would interbreed ignored each other. In other words, the group that had just eaten starch and the group that had eaten maltose, even though they were in the same jar, they wouldn't interbreed. And so what she had done is she'd created reproductive isolation. That's the first component you need to create brand new species. Um, it's weird. Imagine if we had a group of humans where some were eating hamburgers and the other ones were all vegetarians and eventually they just wouldn't interbreed anymore. Um, that's probably not going to happen. But in fruit flies, it did. And so this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have to start with a group, one species. So this is a group of individuals that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And we're eventually going to end up with two species or that process. This is called speciation. So what's the first thing that we have to do? We have to create a barrier. And so that barrier could be physical. So it could be geographic barrier. In other words, one group or one population is isolated. And we could also have changes just within that population. We'll talk about that in a second. But it also those could be pre and post zygotic. And this word zygote means fertilized egg. And so it could be something before the, before the egg is fertilized or after it's fertilized. But these barriers eventually create reproductive isolation. What does that do? We had one species that can't have gene flow. In other words, you've eliminated gene flow. So the genes aren't being mixed within that population and that eventually can create species that have the inability to breed. Um, sometimes that speciation happens really fast. An example would be like in polyploidy in, in plants. Uh, and sometimes it can happen over millions and millions of years. Um, but we know this, once we have speciation, we've created one group uh, that can interbreed with the other. Um, and so let's talk about how that might actually occur. Um, first of all, let me talk about geographic isolation. Geographic isolation is when there is an isolation in the population due to where they exist. So example I'll talk about in a second. Uh, well, first of all, let me define these up here. Mainly you hear these two terms, allopatric and sympatric speciation. Allopatric, patric means homeland. And so uh, allopatric is when you have two groups that are are, that have different different lands or, or, or they live in different lands. Uh, sympatric is when they live in the same land. Uh, but we can kind of tweak that and I'll talk about that in just a second. Example, metal arcs. So we had metal arcs in North America, but during the last ice age, as ice moved down through the middle of the continent, it broke those metal arcs into two populations. We call that allopatric speciation. Now the ice has melted, they're back again, and they're not interbreeding generally in that middle hybrid area. And so that'd be brand new species. Sympatric species Speciation occurs when you have something just within that population. Example, in, in, in plants you can have a mistake in the number of chromosomes that they have so they can't interbreed anymore. It's actually really, really common. I'll talk about that in just a second. That's sympatric or in the same land. But we can also have a gradient, parapatric, parapatric. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Uh, when I was growing up, I thought there were just two different types of, of elephants, and, and there really are. There's the African elephant and the Indian elephant. And there's some huge differences phenotypically when you look at them. So this would be the typical, this is a big male, uh, savanna, African elephant. But what you may not know is that there's a group of forest elephants, sometimes they're referred to as the pygmy elephants, that live in a different area. And if we compare the DNA of these two, the forest uh, elephant is, uh, some scientists consider it a subspecies, and some might even say it's a, it's a separate species itself. In other words, its DNA is two-thirds the difference between an African elephant and an Indian elephant. And so they may be well on their way to uh, forming a brand new species. How did they do that? It's probably one population or one group where they moved into a different area. They're exploiting a different niche. They live in the forest. And so then there's reproductive isolation within that. So where you live can create isolation. What you do can also create isolation as well. And so these are all prezygotic barriers. And so a zygote is a egg that's fertilized by a sperm. So a fertilized egg is referred to as a zygote. And so these three types of isolation, temporal, 
uh, mechanical, and behavior are all things that occur before the zygote is actually formed. So the first type of, of isolation is called temporal. Uh, this right here is an American toad, and this is a Fowler's toad. If you put them in the lab and let them mix, they'll interbreed. Um, you can get them to produce fertile offspring that will, that will survive. Unfortunately, or that's just the way it is, in nature, they may live in the same area, but the American toads generally will breed in the springtime and the Fowler's toads will breed in the fall. And so that's a temporal, and the way I always remember temporal is the word time. They breed at different times of the year, and so even though they could produce for the offspring, they don't. Uh, because of the timing. Example of mechanical isolation, this is a, a study that was done on in uh, snails in Japan. You can see species that live right next to each other. So this one right here looks almost exactly like this snail right here. You'd think same species, but if you lo look a little bit more carefully, you'll find that this one right here, it spirals in one direction, so we could call that left-handed, and this one is going to spiral in the other direction, so we call that right-handed. And so even though these are very similar, their DNA is almost identical identical and they're very uh, closely related. They don't interbreed because their sex parts can't get next to each other. So that's mechanical isolation. You couldn't even transfer the sperm to the egg because they're isolated mechanically. And lastly, we could have a behavioral isolation. So I talked about these. These are two types of uh, metal arcs, the western and the eastern metal arc. They were separated during the last ice age where ice started to come down through the middle of North America. So we now we have the western metal arc, which is our state bird in Montana, eastern metal arc. And so now that we've eliminated that isolation, and they live in this hybrid zone, they don't interbreed. And the reason why is that they attract mates through their songs, and a lot of birds do that. And so the males are able to attract a mate by singing a song. And the more songs that they can sing, the more likely they are to attract a mate. But during this period of time, those songs have separated. And so now we have um, a behavior that's different. And so there's no... Uh, sperm meeting egg. It's a prezygotic barrier. Sometimes we'll actually have organisms living in the same area and the sperm and the egg will get together, but that zygote may die. And so in reefs, what we'll find is that sperm is transferred from one coral to another. It'll fertilize the egg, making a zygote, but that zygote immediately dies. And so that's an example of zygote mortality. Sometimes you'll, you'll have different species living in the same area. So for example, horses and donkeys, you can actually uh, fertilize the egg. You can create a brand new offspring that's called a mule, but it's sterile, so it can't produce more offspring. And so these are all post-zygotic barriers. They're in the same area. They uh, are able to fertilize the egg, but the offspring are sterile. And so it's not able to move any farther than that. And so what does that produce? Well, that produces eventually um, a reduction in the gene flow. And so if you ever have reproductive isolation, the genes can't flow from one area to another. A uh, great study was done on the, the Great China Wall. So the, this wall was built. You have plants on either sp side, um, but some plants are being impacted by that, just that production of the, the wall. And so Ulmus pamilla is a type of plant that's grown on either type, uh, either side of the wall, but it is fertilized by wind. In other words, uh, pollen must be transferred by the wind, and that wall serves as a block to that wind. And so what's happening is you're creating populations on either side that are reproductive, uh, reproductively isolated. In other words, we're seeing a decrease in the DNA, decrease in the genetic va variability. Now, there are other plants that live on either side of the wall that aren't uh, pollinated by wind. They're actually pollinated by insects. And insects have no problem getting over the wall. And so we're seeing that there's actually genetic diversity that's, uh, that's remaining there. And so reproductive isolation can essentially break your species down into two different uh, populations that can't interbreed. Eventually, you can create a brand new species through that. Now, the speciation rate is going to vary. In other words, how fast this occurs. Uh, it can happen very quickly or it can happen slowly over time. So polyploidy is an example of very fast speciation. And so essentially what you have is a mistake in the uh, chromosome number. So we're going from a, a diploid organism to a tetraploid organism. Uh, but it can even get crazier than that. Now what eventually happens, eventually this 
organism can't interbreed with the normally diploid organism, and so you eventually have brand new species forming. Now we find in plants that's incredibly common. Something like 30% of brand new fern species form through this mistake, and 15% of angiosperms, which is all the plants that you're looking at, came to be through a polyploidy or a mistake in the chromosomes. Wheat for example, has been formed through multiple polyploid uh, events. It's rare in, in uh, animals that you can have this. This is an example of a, uh, the Vish Vishaka rat. Um, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. It was formed through polyploidy. In general, if you have uh, any kind of mistake in the chromosome numbers in animals, they die. And the reason why is that you get a duplication of the sex chromosomes. And so what we think happened in this rat is they actually... Um, shed that extra X, uh, XY chromosome or those sex chromosomes, and they're able to reproduce uh, as, a, as a tetraploid animal. Um, now, if we put that aside, there's been a debate going on over um, the actual rate of speciation. And so this is the, the phylogenetic tree that was drawn by uh, Darwin, or it's the, the belief that through time, so if we put T in this direction, speciation occurs gradually over time. Now, there's been a tweak to that. It's just a different form of gradualism called punctuated equilibrium. Uh, its most famous proponent is this man, Stephen Jay Gould, who is an incredible writer. If you're interested in evolution, you could read uh, Panda's Thumb is a great place to start. But his idea is that it doesn't occur gradually over time. It actually occurs very quickly. In other words, there's some kind of a change in the environment which forces speciation to occur. And that would account for why we don't see a lot of these transitional fossils. And also, when we actually study evolution in the lab, we're finding that it can occur very, very quickly. Um, and so that's just another idea on how, how fast speciation can occur. Um, and that's kind of up for debate now. But what do we do know about uh, speciation is it starts with uh, reproductive isolation. So I hope that's helpful.